Next, Einstein showed us that energy is made up of particles with mass that behave like waves. Hmm. Waves like the ones you have in the ocean or sound waves. Now, waves have no mass of their own. They have no mass. They're merely a pattern of movement that travels through stuff that remains where it was. The stuff doesn't move. The pattern moves. For example, I'm talking now, and some air comes out of my mouth and vibrates the air over here. But most of this air stays over here. But the pattern of vibration moves through the air that more or less stays where it is, and then it hits your ears. So the stuff of the universe is made up of matter that has mass or a pattern of motion that has no mass of its own. And this is one of the things that Einstein discovered that light is both a particle or a wave. If it's a wave, it has no mass. If it's a particle, it has mass. Sometimes the stuff of the world is made up of wave patterns, sometimes of particles with mass. It's like the commercial. Sometimes you feel like a wave, sometimes you don't. Particles have mass, but really they're waves that don't. And Einstein's theory of relativity showed us something even more dramatic. You see, Einstein and most theoretical physicists were essentially atheists, including Einstein. Despite the things, the quotes you've heard about God doesn't play dice with the universe, he believed in the natural world, no intelligent creator, with no designer, no personal God for sure. And he went so far as to correct any misunderstandings. He clarified that. So these scientists believed in the material world without any intentional sentient creator. The world, they believe, appears to have always existed more or less in its present form. There's no need for a creator. There's not even a need for any beginning of the universe. For all we know, it was always like this. Then in 1922, Alexander Friedman, a Russian mathematician, looked at Einstein's equations and said, according to Einstein's equations, the universe is expanding. Well, if the universe is expanding, we just go back in time and it ends up going back and back and back and back to a point. And that means it may have had a beginning. And if it had a beginning, then before the beginning, it didn't exist. Friedman's new idea would bring science around to confront a question that had been relegated to religion. Scientists weren't even talking about that. But there may have been a moment of creation when the universe came into being. And before that, there was nothing. Einstein wasn't comfortable with this. Hmm. He didn't like the non-static implications of his own theory of relativity. The equations he had come up with that described the structure of the physical universe did in fact suggest that the universe was changing, unless he added a cosmological constant to the equation, just took the equation and said, plus this. This is the amount it has to be, so we have to assume that that represents something. We'll figure out what it is later. And he added it to all of his equations, and there you go, you have a static universe. Einstein did that in an act that he called the biggest blunder of my life. <laughs> you think it would be my divorce <laughs> but That was the biggest blunder of my life. <laughs> but why did he do it? What were the implications he was trying to avoid? Well, at that time, there had been no evidence the universe was expanding. For all we knew, it may have been the same throughout all time. There was no evidence that it was different in the past. And ironically, it would have been another source of validation for Einstein's theory. If prior to discovering the evidence of the expansion of the universe, he said, my theory says it's expanding. That's what happened when he said light waves bend. There was no evidence that shows that light waves bend because of gravity. And then they did an experiment, during a solar eclipse, and they were able to see that light waves that pass close to the sun actually bent. They changed the path of their travel. And that was a validation of his theory. And this one would have been another source of validation for Einstein's theory. But he committed that big blunder. Einstein's fudge factor blunder may have been added precisely to avoid the implication that an exp expanding universe would have had to have a beginning. It was just too much like religious creation stories in which, once upon a time, the universe was not. And it was. With the cosmological constant, the universe could be static, uncaused like this forever, a world without end, without a beginning, with no need for a creator or a first cause. Science could forge ahead in agnostic unbelief and not even consider the question of creation. That's what they tried to do. But in the late 1920s, Edwin Hubble presented evidence that the universe was indeed expanding. And in the 1940s, George Gamow, another Russian scientist, 
presented a theory that the universe began in a great fireball, a big bang. In this now accepted cosmology, some 14 billion years ago, everything that is, that is, all the matter and energy, even the four dimensions of time and space, burst forth from a state of infinite or near infinite density, temperature, and pressure. Before that moment, there was nothing, no time, no space, no matter, nothing, nada, zilch. And since everything that has a beginning before which it was not must have a cause to bring it into being and get it started, the universe must have a cause, or so some people argue. This does suggest the existence of something that is not the universe itself, that brought the universe, everything, into existence, that got things started. Before the existence of the universe, which means before the existence of time, without anything to get things going, it would seem that the universe would have simply remained unmanifested. Unfortunately, the atheists and the scientists countered that a total lack of knowledge and understanding could not be used to prove the existence of something for which we have no evidence. What science tells us, and all that science tells us, according to the physicists such as Stephen Hawking, is that, quote, in real time, the universe has a beginning and an end at singularities that form a boundary to space-time and at which the laws of science break down. Or as Alan Guth, the MIT cosmologist, said, the instant of creation remains unexplained. At another point, Hawking said, the actual point of creation lies outside the scope of presently known laws of physics. So, uh-oh. There I was committed to the scientific understanding of things and it was beginning to smash up against questions that it had, even the scientists were saying, they had no reason to believe that, that science would be able to answer them. Some people have this faith in science, we'll answer everything, but the scientists who are the, the leading physicists were saying, we have no reason, no basis to know that we'll ever be able to answer these questions. So this limitation of science and the boundaries of understanding became accentuated when I turned to take a look at quantum physics, the Alice in Wonderland world of quantum physics. As Niels Bohr, one of the founders of quantum theory, said, quote, we all agree that your theory is crazy, but is it crazy enough? <laughs> <laughs> at another point, he said, anyone that is not shocked by quantum theory doesn't understand it. Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman put it more directly when he said, I think I can safely say that no one understands quantum physics. <laughs> These quotations from famous physicists are not out of context exaggerations. Quantum physics is fundamentally paradoxical and nonsensical to the human mind. It has contradictions in it that cannot make sense to the human mind. Physicists have now long given up on visualization, the ability to develop a model. Remember the model? And I think Niels Bohr was, was it, Planck? it was Niels Bohr, I think, or Planck, or one of them developed the model of the atom with the nucleus and the electrons. So you could see this thing with little balls vibrating and the electrons going around. It was a model you could hold in your mind. But when the quantum physicists got into that model and looked at it, what is the electron? What is the proton? It all broke down and tumbled into virtually nothingness. It's, it, that's just a metaphor. That picture of the balls and the other balls running around it is a metaphor from our personal experience for something. It's a model. Indeed, some would say that quantum physics has done away with the notion of any reality that exists without an observer. There are actually quite a few physicists who would argue that. And as J.B.S. Haldane said, quote, the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. Now, Holden was a great evolutionary biologist, and I suspect he was reflecting on the limits of the evolved human psyche. Our brains were not designed to understand the fundamental structure of the universe. Reality is clearer than our brains are capable of imagining. For another example, because I can go through go dozens of these, consider that in the latest range in theoretical physics, string theory, the most popular version, posits an 11-dimensional universe. Right? <laughs> of which our minds are capable of conceiving four. Uh, the x-axis, the y-axis, and the, the z-axis, you know, x, y, and z. The three of space, and the one of time. 